or welcome to our evening service, our 6 p.m. service. So whenever you are watching uh, this, my name's David Cook and I'm, I'm really um, uh, overjoyed to be able to welcome you. And I thank you for tuning in or, or clicking. We've, um, we love having you uh, with us. And uh, tonight we're going to worship uh, together. There's going to be a time just for you to engage with God. We've prayed that you would be blessed. And uh, also, uh, we are continuing in our, our series on uh, Isaiah. But I really uh, also want to uh, just thank uh, Maxine uh, Neely, who's a, a friend of Holy Trinity Barnes. And uh, she is uh, going to lead just lead a time of prayer. She was resident uh, here, but she's now uh, resident in the, in the United States. And I've asked her specifically uh, to pray uh, into the whole... Uh, outworking of the the things that we have all witnessed following the death of of George Floyd and and I um, I'm so grateful uh, to Maxine for leading our, our prayers this evening and agreeing to do that uh, so uh, thank you Maxine let me pray for us this evening Holy Spirit we say that wonderful prayer of the church come thank you as we look at the life of Hezekiah Bless us this evening. Speak to us this evening. Change us this evening. And we offer you our hearts. We just come humbly. We know we're needful of you. And we just say, come Holy Spirit. In your amazing grace.
Hello Holy Trinity Barnes, my name is Maxine Neely and until 2015 I attended and worshipped with so many of you at H.T. Barnes. Photo credit has pride of place in my home and holds such warm and wonderful memories um, for me. David was in touch recently and asked if I would be willing to lead um, some prayers for your online service, given where I am placed and given what we've been experiencing these past couple of days following the death two weeks ago of George Floyd. We all watched in horror as he lay dying under the knee of a police officer, begging to breathe, being ignored. From that, a firestorm has erupted at the injustice of what happened. There have been protests and marches. Unfortunately, alongside that, there has been looting and violence, but people are angry and they're looking for change. Martin Luther King once had a dream and hoped that his children would one day be judged by the content of their character rather than the colour of their skin. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Any black person deserves the protection and respect of the law, regardless of any crimes they may or may not have committed. They definitely do not deserve to die in the street in the way that this man did. I wasn't one for protests and attending marches, but this time it was different and I chose to take a stand and participate, which I did with my 15 year old son. He chose to come along with me under no pressure because he had seen what had happened and he wanted to take a stand too. It wasn't only George Floyd that I marched for. I also marched for Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Botham Jean, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Alton Sterling. All of these African-American men and women who have died in the custody of the police and there has been no accounting for their death. I want to pray for justice. I want to pray for change and I want to pray for healing. There is a lot of heart brokenness going on here. There are people who still don't feel free to walk the streets because of the colour of their skin. We aren't free until we are all free. I shared that with David and I believe that still. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you with hope of change, with a hope of justice. I pray for justice, Lord, that that would come that would come to George Floyd's family, that others will be held accountable for his senseless death. Lord, bring your justice. This isn't an impossible situation because we know that nothing is impossible with you. And I hold on to that hope. I pray for change, Lord. I pray for change in the systemic racism that per pervades the police force here. I know that there are good policemen, Lord, and I'm thankful for that. But change has to happen, Lord, and I pray that you would help to, to bring this in. I pray for healing, your healing, the healing that goes to the very heart of us. There is so much brokenness right now. There is so much anger right now. And I pray that you would come, heal that, heal our land, Lord. 
bring back balance, bring back hope. I trust in you for this, Lord. And I know that you would not leave me in want. I pray, Lord, that you would come, you would touch each one of us, that we would listen and hear from you, to hear what our part is in the midst of this, whether to speak or to walk or to pray. Lord, help us to know what to do. Precious name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Thank you. Today's reading is taken from Isaiah 39. Soon after this, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah his best wishes and a gift. He had heard that Hezekiah had been very sick and that he had recovered. Hezekiah was delighted with the Babylonian envoys and showed them everything in his treasure houses the silver, the gold, the spices and the aromatic oils. He also took them to see his army and showed them everything in his royal treasuries. There was nothing in his palace or kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked him, what did those men want? Where were they from? Hezekiah replied, they came from the distant land of Babylon. What did they see in your palace? asked Isaiah. They saw everything, Hezekiah replied. I showed them everything I own, all my royal treasuries. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Listen to this message from the Lord of Heaven's armies. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasures stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, said the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, This message you have given me from the Lord is good. For the king was thinking, at least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. Well, good evening, everyone, and yeah, welcome to our uh, continuation uh, on our journey through the book of Isaiah. And last week, uh, Alex, yeah, just wonderfully uh, brought us to this wonderful passage uh, of this story of Hezekiah. And yeah, just such a, a, f a foundational passage to the book of Isaiah that really sort of is, is the bookend at the end of the first part of the book. As we saw several weeks ago, sort of that, that contrast that we, as we saw the overview of the whole book, that God and Isaiah were going to paint this contrast between King Ahaz and King Hezekiah. Ahaz who rejects the message of God and Hezekiah who puts his faith and trust in God. And we saw that so amazingly with this sort of, yeah, real kind of passage of judgment upon God's people that, you know, the 46 cities of Judah have been destroyed and Jerusalem alone stands. And yet God saves them. Hezekiah cries out to God and God rescues them. The Assyrian army is destroyed uh, and decimated as they head back to Nineveh. Defeated, uh, not by Judah itself, uh, but by God himself. And be be before Isaiah moves us into sort of the second part of his book, as we begin what many call the book of comfort, where we see so much hope and restoration uh, and so much life, uh, where we have been sort of really leading up in some ways and in, in many ways leading up to the passages and the chapters of chapter 36 and 37, that, that, that story as Sennacherib comes and invades. So much of the judgment prophesied by Isaiah is leading us to that moment. And then it's gone. Uh, and God delivers them, so we sort of get to jump into the book of comfort. But before we do, there's these two interesting chapters at the end of the first part of the book. And in chapter 38, uh, we see that Hezekiah is sick, uh, and God actually says he's going to die. But Hezekiah prays to God, and God adds num a number of years to his life, and he is saved. 
And in chapter 39, which is our passage for this evening, we then see that as a result of this sickness uh, and the result of his healing from this sickness, that Babylon sends envoys to come and congratulate King Hezekiah. Now, the chapters 38 and 39 potentially happen chronologically before uh, the previous chapters, but they're arranged this way to show us that we are sort of heading into a new phase of the book where no longer will Assyria be the problem, uh, but where Babylon will be the problem. And one of the first promises of uh, the book of comfort as we enter into chapter 40 and onwards is the hope that they will return from exile. And the exile that Judah experiences was not at the hands of Assyria, but it was at the hands of Babylon. And so it's probably arranged this way, out of chronological order, to show us that we're now moving in uh, to sort of the the second part of the book, where where Babylon will be sort of the the main enemy. But at this point, uh, Babylon is not really a major force in the world. They're sort of a a smaller nation that's, that's sort of beginning to rise a little bit, Uh, But they're certainly not greatly feared, uh, and they're certainly not hugely powerful at the point where uh, where this king sends envoys to come to Hezekiah. And so they arrive, and they want to sort of bring a gift to say, you know, well done for getting better, that we've heard of this great miracle that happened, and we're just, we're happy. Uh, Now, they potentially have some political motives here too, that they're perhaps trying to suss out what Hezekiah has, whether he's strong enough to make an alliance with Uh, Is this, you know, how favorably are we going to be met by the king of Judah, who seems to have a powerful God on his side? And so they come. They arrive uh, to see Hezekiah. Now, when Hezekiah welcomes them, he doesn't just show them some, some good and proper hospitality. He doesn't just welcome them and say thank you and, you know, put them up for the night and give them some food. He, he seems to just show them absolutely everything that he has. Uh, in Almost sort of out of this potential sense of pride and arrogance to say, hey, come and see everything that I have. They don't ask to see this, that he does not, he's not forced uh, by the hand of a strong king to, to reveal everything he has. He willingly takes these people and he just shows them everything, everything he has. And it makes me think about uh, people that I've met who... You know, you try and have a conversation with them and it just ends up with them talking about all the things that they have. Uh, People that have placed their value in objects and possessions that just want to talk about all the things they have. And as though that's a normal and relational conversation. It's very hard. I find it very hard to relate to people like that uh, because it doesn't really feel like they want to talk to you. They just want to boast and they want to show off and they want to tell you everything they have. Sometimes kids can be like this. Uh, And sometimes my kids can be like this, uh, where they can argue over who has the best of this and who's the strongest at this and who has, you know, who's made the best tower and who's made the worst tower. Uh, And they want to show things off. You know, they want to show you this is what I did. And when friends come, they want to show them all the toys they've got. Hezekiah almost has this sense of this sort of one-upmanship that he wants to to demonstrate his power, his wealth, his authority. And so he lets them come in and see everything. And he's probably got quite a lot of stuff. He wants to show how successful he is, how much he is worth taking seriously, how much of a strong king and a strong empire the nation of Judah actually is. We want to Im- he wants to impress people with the things that he has and the things that he's done. And this isn't something that just our kids struggle with. This is something that... that I struggle with that that many adults struggle with as well that desire to to prove ourselves by what we have or what we've done and and I often found this being uh, in missions where we we have to write newsletters every month to let our supporters know what we're up to and to even hopefully gain a few more people that want to help support us in the ministry we were doing where there's almost this sense of you know how do we communicate accurately but without the temptation to be to be proud or boastful in the things that we've done or the things that we're experiencing or the things that we're doing. Or even the temptation to, you know, slightly uh, embellish those things, to make it look slightly better than what it is or to, you know, to really make people think that that's the whole point of what we're doing. These temptations can be prevalent in, in every aspect of life. 
And Hezekiah clearly finds that struggle as well. And maybe he doesn't even think it's a struggle. He just thinks it's great. And he wants to impress these people. Now, God has a problem with this. And Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and he says, you know, what, what did you show them? What did they see? And Isaiah says, well, I showed them absolutely everything. And I wonder if he's almost sort of proudfully saying this, like he's ready for the pat on the back to say, well done. But that's not what Isaiah says. In fact, Isaiah rebukes him. And the word of the Lord says that everything you've shown them will be carried away. That actually Babylon will return one day, not as your ally, but they will come and they will carry away everything that you have shown them. Your pride and arrogance will fall and you will be humbled before this very nation. Now that, that, that's quite a, uh, that should be quite a challenging message from the prophet. That should be something that, that deeply troubles Isaac, uh, that deeply troubles Hezekiah. That God is, is telling him that, that the pride and arrogance of, of him and his nation is going to result in their downfall. You know, Hezekiah, when in chapter 38, when Hezekiah gets told that he's going to die because he's sick, his response is to beg the Lord, to beg the Lord to give him more days. He's not happy uh, that's, that he's going to die. Hezekiah tells us in chapter 38, verse 2, it says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed, Please, O Lord, remember how I walked before you in the fullness of in fullness and with a whole heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And it tells us that Hezekiah wept bitterly. He cries out and says, please, Lord, remember me. And he cries because he's going to die. Well, now God tells him that, that his whole nation is going to be carried away. And not only that, but he tells him in verse 7, that some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So now he says that, that, that your, your nation and your sons are going to be carried off into exile. You know, this is devastating news. This is far bigger than, than you've, got a, you've got a sickness and you're going to die. This is your entire nation is going to fall. That your sons are going to fall. That, that the throne of David might be in peril here. So how, how is Hezekiah going to respond? Well, when it's about himself, he weeps bitterly. And here's what he does when it's about other people, including his own sons. Verse 8 says, Hezekiah, Then said Hezekiah of Israel, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. You go, that is such a confusing response. When you were going to die, you wept bitterly and cried out. And now your sons are going to get carried off. And your response is, well, at least it's not going to happen to me. That this is a good word of the Lord. Because it, there will be peace in my days. Hezekiah seems so almost self, uh, self-involved and self-absorbed. That when it comes to his own health cries out and weeps when it comes to the lives of his own sons he almost seems to not care he's become so individualistic in his in, in himself in his own kingdom and his own generation that he can't even see a future and he doesn't seem to care about the fact that there is no future you know hezekiah is, is a king on the line a king on the throne of david he's in the line of david there's a the great covenant promise to that line that Hezekiah just seems fine to abandon as long as it doesn't happen whilst he's alive. Hezekiah's son, the son that will take over the throne from him, is, is, is a king called Manasseh. And if you read about Manasseh, he was horrendous, an awful king, so full of idolatry that, in fact, that as, as Hezekiah reformed the nation, God sort of said, okay, I will... I will prolong the days until this exile comes, until Babylon comes. As a result of the sin of Manasseh, God says, okay, this is happening now. His son was awful. You know, and you have to wonder what, you know, what did his dad teach him about God? Did Hezekiah care 
about Manasseh? Did he care about the way that he would rule the next generation of the kingdom? Or was he just happy that he himself was alive and that he would die in peace? An individual gospel that is only focused on yourself doesn't see the big picture of what God is doing, either now or in future generations. And that kind of gospel is a dangerous one. And I think that very often today, our gospel, just like Hezekiah's, has become so individualized. That the entire gospel is boiled down to just you and your own personal commitment to God. Whether you are saved or not. And of, of course there's, there's, there's a large part of, of what God is doing that is about individuals. Okay? And we know that we, we need to make our own choices. But that is not the fullness of the picture of his kingdom or the gospel. It's a far bigger story that has been unfolding for generations and generations and may just continue to keep unfolding for generations and generations after we have gone. There have been moves of God in, in, in the church age that have been built upon generations of prayer. Not just I want to see God do something and now it happens, but, but people who in generations gone by have said, we believe that God is doing something and we want to invest our lives in prayer and they died never seeing the fulfillment of that word. There have been revivals traced back to generations gone by before them. Because people had a heart to see that what happened to the next generation was worth fighting for. It was worth investing in. Sometimes it can be so easy, often because of the gospel that we're fed, that's just about you and your sins and your salvation, that we can forget and not even be aware that, that a part of our, our vocation in the kingdom is that we care about the kingdom. And the kingdom is not about me. I am not the king. <laughs> Jesus is. And he is doing a much bigger work than just me and just the things that he wants to do in me. Do I see that? Am I aware of that? Do I want to be invested in the things that I will never see the fruition of? Do I care about what happens in my children's generation and my grandchildren's generation? An individualized gospel means that we can often miss the injustices of our world. That we end up playing catch up to the world when major injustices happen, like we're experiencing right now. I mean, it's such a wonderful prayer and word from Maxine today. If we aren't aware of those things happening within our own church and within our own city, perhaps we have believed a gospel that is far too individual, that is not the gospel that Jesus brought. A gospel of a kingdom where God cared about not just you, but about the world that you live in. Or is it just about me? Is it just about me and my health and my life and my days? Hezekiah shows us that when we stop caring about the next generation, when we care more about our own lives than we do about the lives of those who are coming after us, it gets messy and it gets messy quickly. And the place that I really believe that we can begin this is in down on our hands and knees, in, is, is in the place of prayer. That we, I really believe that we need to be investing time in prayer for what God is doing both now in the world and we have to be involved in prayer and often more than just prayer but in action and in word. And we also need to be investing time and prayer into the future generations of the church within our nation, within our city, and within this world. Praying for, for those of us that have children, praying for our children and, and the kingdom of God that will be established in their day. For our grandchildren, for, for the great, great, great grandchildren that we will never be alive to witness. Do we care about what they inherit? Are we praying for those things? Are we praying for moves of God to happen? Not just now, but in their days. The book of Hebrews, so wonderfully in chapter 11, 
draws us this great list of, the, of these heroes of the faith. And in there twice, uh, in chapter 11, verse 13 to 16, and then near the end in verse 39. The author of Hebrews draws us to the fact that, that all of the list of, of people that, that, the, that the author lays out for us, he says that every single one of them died without seeing the fulfillment of what was promised. They were walking in the midst of generations who were awaiting the fulfillment of God's promise. They were awaiting it and they never saw it before they died. And yet they pressed on and yet they prayed and yet they were faithful. Because they cared not just about their own lives, but they cared about their sons' lives. They cared about their daughters' lives. They cared about the world that the next generation would walk in. Many times in Israel's history, they set up memorials to try and remind the next generation of what God had done. And it wasn't just physical things it was people who gave their lives in pursuit of what God was going to do in the next generation and I really think that this passage challenges us to to come back to a place of prayer to in you know in so much of the book we're supposed to be like Hezekiah we're supposed to be the king that trusts the Lord in these chapters I believe we're challenged to not be like him that we are not supposed to care more about our own lives and about our own well-being than we are about the lives of those around us and those vulnerable in society and the next generation. We are called back to a place of prayer, to plow in, to put in the hard work and hours to see a gospel that goes beyond ourselves, a gospel that reaches generations ahead of us. So I just, I invite you this week to join me in prayer, not for yourself, but for the world around us and for the future generations of the church.
Well, thank you, Stephen, for um, your word from Isaiah 39. I just want to now, um, uh, I want to pray for uh, you. And I encourage you, you might want, just want to, to close your eyes. You might want to just maybe put your hands facing up just to receive what God wants uh, to give to you, to say to you. So I, I just pray, um, come, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And thank you, Lord, that you, you just that, that, that message of, of just the gospel not being an individual thing. You are working your purposes far more widely than we can see in the now, Lord. And I just, I just pray for everyone who's, there are, there are things that, that you are sowing into that the generations and people who will follow you will experience. And I pray, Holy Spirit, for your blessing over that. Thank you just for, for people. Uh, just, just, you might want to just pray for your workplace. I pray for the place that you're called to work. That God, you, you would minister deeply to those uh, gifts that you've given each each person for their work, the work of their hands. More Holy Spirit. More Holy Spirit. Shumba. Just pray, I just I said bring your just just the your workplace, your and maybe you're looking at, at new things, your Maybe, or maybe that's looking insecure, but just offer it to the Lord. And, and Lord, I pray this blessing and just receive this uh, blessing over your heart. This is from 1 Thessalonians 5. It says this now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. And I pray the blessing of the Father, the blessing of the Son, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And have a blessed week. Or if you're watching this in the week, may the Lord bless you. Amen.